In the popular media, many times arises the bad reputation of the F-104 Starfighter in the Luftwaffe or in general. In the 60s, the Luftwaffe lost many of them, while also many pilots perished in the accident. For this reason, the Starfighter earned the not so flattering nickname Widowmaker. Was the safety record of the plane so awful? In this video, we try to figure out this and put into perspective the F-104 family compared to other jet fighter planes since World War II. Before presenting the statistics of the German Starfighters, let's see the main features of the version operated by the Luftwaffe compared to the US A and C variants. The G version differed due to its new role as a low-level strike plane. Because of the increased load on the airframe, the structure was strengthened, which increased the weight of the plane. It was also necessary to redesign the landing gears to deal with the higher operation weight. In the end, compared to the C variant, the empty weight of the airframe increased from 5.7 tons to 6.2 tons. The maximum takeoff weight was about 13 tons. To compensate the effect of the heavier airframe and the drag of strike weapons carried, it was necessary to increase the thrust of the engine. The G variant was powered by the more powerful G79 GE 11A turbojet engine. It had 46 kN thrust with maximum military setting and 71 kN with maximum afterburner power on testbed. Compared to the 6.2 tons empty weight of the airframe, the thrust was adequate in the era. The internal fuel capacity increased from 2840 liters of the C variant to 3400 liters. With the wing tip fuel tank and underwing drop tanks, the maximum fuel load increased from 6155 liters to 6750 liters. The engine intake was modified, it got electrically powered de-icing equipment. The size of the rudder was increased and the operation of the flaps also differed. To improve the maneuverability at low speeds, the flaps got a new intermediate setting with 15 degrees deflection. Using this at 1.5 km altitude, the turning radius could be 33% smaller compared to the A and C variants. To reduce the length of the deceleration, following the high-speed landing, a larger drag chute was applied. The diameter of the chute increased from 4.9 meters to 5.5 meters because of the higher operation weight. The original Lockheed-made C-1 ejection seat was launched downwards. At high speeds and altitudes, this was not a serious issue, but during takeoff and landing, it made it virtually impossible to leave the plane safely. Therefore, a modified C2 ejection seat was developed based on the requirements of the US Air Force leaving the cockpit upwards. However, because the G variant was intended to be used in a low-level strike role, this type of ejection seat still didn't have the sufficiently quick response time. Thus, Martin Baker GQ7A seats were built in for German Starfighters. It had a double zero ejection capability, it was possible to leave the plane at ground with zero speed. The combat potential of the F-104G were basically determined by the Litton FM3 type inertial navigation system and the F-15A multimode radar. The latter had not only air-to-air -air, but also navigation, ground mapping and distance measures modes because of the strike roll. The F-104G was a surprisingly advanced fighter jet regardless the plane was only 7 tons. Fighters in the era with similar size and weight lacked multi-mode radar and many times the inertial navigation system either. Despite the quality improvements of the avionics, the loadout of the Starfighter remained quite light. The maximum weapon load was increased only up to 1360 kg. This meant only some 100 pound bombs or a pair of 1000 pound class bombs or unguided rocket pots. In fighter role, the plane could carry two 4 AM9 Simander missiles. The very basic features of the Starfighter could not be changed dramatically. The weight and quantity of the armament corresponded what was expected from a fighter which was designed originally as a pure interceptor. In fact, the career of the Starfighter was a bit similar to fighters which were demoted to strike role when they became obsolete as a first-line fighter. The only difference was that the German planes were newly built airframes and got an upgraded avionics for the new role. The Starfighter was an unsuccessful plane in the United States. 
Out of the total 722 originally ordered for the Air Force, only 296 were actually delivered, the remainder was cancelled. Its service with the Air Defense Command and the Tactical Command was brief. Most of the manufactured planes were transferred to the Air National Guard or they were exported to overseas customers like Taiwan, Pakistan and Jordan. Only the foreign sales saved the plane from being a footnote in aviation history. The Starfighter as an export product was successful, more than 2000 were built. The new operators replaced in many cases subsonic fighters with the Mach 2 capable Starfighter. The F-104s in average served 20-25 years in different air forces, but in Italy the last Starfighter retired only in 2004, following 41 years of service. The Italian ESA variant had even beyond visual range capability thanks to the AIM-7 Sparrow missile. The Italian planes were unique among the Starfighters with this feature. Regarding with the selection and acquisition of the F-104 in Germany, additional content is available for the highest level Patreon supporters. Now let's look the career of the Starfighter primarily in the Luftwaffe. The chart on the picture what raised doubts about what the reality was and where started the media circus which later evolved to an urban legend. What can we see in the chart? The airframe loss per 10,000 hours flown and its trend. At the beginning of the German service the high loss rate is striking. However, this quickly subsided and we can see significantly lower specific loss in the remaining 20 years of service. Considering the very different periods of the service, it is worth examining more closely the safety record of the German Starfighter fleet. The reputation of the Starfighter family, but especially of the German ones to this day is largely determined by the initial period and the exaggeration of the problems by the press. There are several sources available for examining accident rates, but there is some variation between them. We will see these discrepancies do not have substantial effect on the final conclusions. Multiplying the values shown in the diagram by 10 gives the generally accepted specific airplane loss per 100,000 flight hours. The use of this value is common because it involves the rate of the use of the airplanes. If a fleet flies a lot, the annual aircraft loss can be higher than a barely flying fleet has, while the small annual airframe loss of fleet flying fewer hours could mean a proportionally higher specific loss rate. The German language chart seems a useful source at first glance, but more closely compared to the other sources, its accuracy is maybe questionable at several points. Data about the F-104G is available on a website that deals with the Starfighter in great detail, the link is in the video description. It also includes a list with all lost aircraft, the total numbers of hours flown by the fleet and the losses of the training unit stationed at Luke Air Force Base. The brief summary of the cause and circumstances of the loss of the aircraft are also included. By checking the list of losses, we can find in 1963 not a single plane was lost neither in Germany or at Luke Air Force Base. In contrast, in the diagram in 1963, the specific loss differs from zero, so according to the diagram was at least one airframe loss. Except from this error, the large fluctuation and the trend line in the diagram can be true. For this reason alone, the diagram cannot be completely discarded, but it has to be checked the values and their meanings. According to the German portal used as a first source, the total amount of flight hours flown of the fleet is 1,975,646 hours. Using the second source, the summarized flight hours of the regiments, including the training unit at Luke Air Force Base is only 1,955,251 hours. The difference is marginal only 1%. However, the first source considers the specific loss by counting only the 292 airplanes lost in Germany, excluding the ground losses as they did not crash. Also, it does not take into account the additional 42 lost planes at Luke Air Force Base. Thus, considering the number of planes, the difference between the calculated losses is about 14%. These values are summarized in the table. The first row of the table shows that the number of airframes lost on the ground has a marginal effect on the specific losses. The additional 6 lost planes do not mislead the calculation. 
The second row shows the separated and the combined specific laws of the two fleets in Germany and in the United States. Using the different inputs, the calculated specific loss rate is between 14.8 and 17.3 planes per 100,000 flight hours. This is not a big difference, these values are already good enough for comparison with other airplane times, but let's not be satisfied with that. On the presented chart, the specific loss rate are higher in almost each year than what is calculated over a lifetime. In fact, if we calculate the average of the values in the diagram, the result is 33.3 losses per 100,000 flight hours. So how is it possible to get considerably lower loss rate using the number of lost planes and total flight hours? Because of the different calculation method. When we make the average, the yearly specific loss values, the average value is different from the case when the total flight hours and lost airframes are used for the whole service life. The loss ratio calculated for the entire service approximately 15-17 aircraft loss per 100,000 flight hours if the lost planes and total flight hours are used. On the other hand, the losses read and calculated from the chart before 1971 typically shows a value of 20 losses per 100,000 flight hours or even higher. By following 1971, the loss rate was mostly between 15 and 20. Using the presented diagram and knowing the quantity of lost planes, the total number of hours flown by the fleet can be calculated backwards. But only with the assumption that the same number of hours flown per aircraft in each year, regardless of the number of aircraft lost, which is likely not true. Let's see the calculation for a particular year. If the amount of aircraft lost in a given year is known, and it is multiplied by the specific losses from the first diagram, we get the number of hours flown in that year. So in 1965 we get 29,885 hours using the 26 lost planes and 82 losses per 100,000 flight hours value. Doing the calculation for every year and summarizing them, the result is only 1,307,990 flight hours. This is about 77% of the flight hours which had already been presented from the chart. This supports the assumption that the starfighters flew more and more as it became safer. So despite the much more flight hours, the specific loss became smaller in the 70s and later. This is why leads to a false result averaging the specific loss of each year. The problem can be explained well through an imaginary but very simple case. If two planes crash in the first year with 10,000 flight hours, that means 20 losses per 100,000 flight hours. If two planes crash in the second year with 20,000 flight hours, that means 10 losses per 100,000 flight hours. So the specific loss is half of the first year. Using the specific loss values obtained from the first two years, 15 losses per 100,000 flight hours is the calculated specific loss. If the total flight hours and lost airframes are used of the first two years, then the result is 13.33 losses per 100,000 flight hours. This simple example shows 12% difference in terms of specific loss why the same data was used but with different methodologies. Considering the specific loss was much lower after the first 7 years of service of the Starfighter, much more aircraft flew with much smaller losses. This effect is easily can cause the 23% discrepancy in the backward calculated flight hours. More than 90% of the flight hours were generated following 1967. So the values shown on the first diagram can be quite accurate in almost each year, just the difference calculation method causes the difference. The diagram and the data from the German language site also shows the anomaly in the year of 1983. In that year, the specific loss is much smaller than in 1982 and 1984. This is consistent with the itemized loss list from the other source. While the Luftwaffe lost 12 airframes in 1982 and 8 in 1984, but only 4 were lost in 1983. So the first presented diagram seems correct, the trend what it shows is very real. If we accept the trend shown in the chart, it can be seen that after the initial few horrific years, the specific loss rate of the 104 was on par with other supersonic fighter planes in the era, 
or was even better. It is another matter that a lower specific loss rate not necessarily means a lower airframe loss in a given year. In the four years between 1961 and 1964, 19 aircraft were lost and only in 1965, 26 aircraft were written off. By compared to the horrible year of 1962, the specific loss rate was only half in 1965. This situation is possible due to more planes and higher amounts of hours flown. The amount of flight hours increased, the specific loss improved, but the number of aircraft lost nevertheless increased. However, the high number of lost planes provided for the press an excellent basis for criticizing the German Starfighter program. For the press, only the high number of lost planes was interesting, because it could be sold as a sensation. Now it's time to put into perspective the loss rate of German Starfighter fleet to give them a real meaning. How should we judge the roughly 15-17 airframe losses per 100,000 flight hours? It is worth comparing both subsonic and supersonic fighter planes in the era. The table show the statistics of different fighter jets in Hungary. The MiG-21 F-13 entered service in Hungary in 1961, the PF in 1964, the MF version in 1971. All of them can be considered contemporaries of the F-104 from a design point of view. The values in the diagram are showing how improved their safety. For all MiG-21 variants in the era F-13 PF-MF, the airframe loss per 100,000 hours fell from 42.9 to 10.8 considering the total service life of these MiG-21 variants. Only the MF variant had better specific loss rate than the F-104G. The PF was literally identical with the German Starfighters. The safety of the MiG-21 family improved with time just as happened with the Starfighter. At the beginning, it was very similar to F-104 considering how high was the loss rate of the MiG-21 F-14 variant. It had 42.9 loss planes per 100,000 flight hours specific loss, but not as an initial single year value, it is the average of 20 years of service. Whoa. Both Germany and Hungary had to learn using the Mach 2 capable fighters which unfortunately cost many lives. Anyway, according to the Hungarian pilots, the PF variant had the most favorable handling characteristics, but regardless of this, the MF variant had the lowest loss rate in Hungary. The major improvement in accident rate already happened for the PF variant, its loss rate was 60% lower compared to the F-13 variant. The statistics of US Air Force with early supersonic fighters were just as horrible initially, if not worse, what the German starfighters had. A very good example is the F-100 Super Sabre. Somehow the press at the time didn't make a big deal about it. Comparing to the early years of the F-100, the German Starfighter was barely different. In Hungary, only the MiG-21 MF had better specific loss rate than the German Starfighter considering the whole service period. Every other supersonic fighter in Hungary was worse. The MiG-23 MF, a generation later fighter compared to the MiG-21s, was only roughly on par with the Starfighter. While the MiG-23 MF was not used for a low water strike, which is more dangerous than performing medium-high altitude fighter missions. What is quite shocking that the performance of the MiG-29s was even worse than the MiG-23 MFs. The main cause of this weak safety record is the severe lack of funding and the low amount of available flight hours following the Cold War era. Besides the specific loss value, it is worth comparing the percentage losses of the fleets during their service life. But this can be only a secondary indicator because it is not weighted with the flight hours. This percentage loss depends on the length of service, but weighting with the flight hours is not achieved by this method. Not every country operates its air force transparently, so in many cases only aircraft losses are known, but the flight hours of the fleets are not. Germany acquired in total 914 Starfighters. Of these, 292 to 6 were lost in Germany and other 42 in the United States during training. This is not a catastrophically bad ratio considering the 25 years of service. 37% of the planes were lost in the Luftwaffe, including the planes at Luke Air Force Base. Excluding the training facility and ground losses, 
The indicator is even better, the loss is only 32%. In contrast, in Hungary, with the exception of the MiG-21 MF, none of the subvariants had significantly better fleet loss rate, while their length of service was roughly the same 20-25 years. It is apparent that the German F-104s did not have significantly worse specific or fleet percentage loss, while the Hungarian Air Force never used the MiGs in low-level attack or strike role. In fact, compared to a Soviet plane, the Starfighter seems almost a state of arting. The Soviet Su-9 interceptor, due to the rush development and production, had exceptionally bad loss rate. About one-third of the planes crashed and other one-third fell victim to the engine fire on the ground, while the planes were not in service even two decades. In the Soviet Union, of course, this information was not known to the public. Now we have known the statistics of the German fighter planes, but what about the pilots? This is how the Starfighter made videos, according to the critics. In Hungary, 32 pilots lost their lives flying on MiG-21s, while 65 different versions of the MiGs were lost. This means a 50% loss rate, every second pilot did not survive the crash of a MiG-21. In comparison, 116 or 119 Starfighter pilots, depending on the source, killed during the service or training with the F-104s. Considering the 292 plus 42 aircraft loss, this means 35% loss rate, about two-thirds of the pilots survived the loss of a Starfighter. In total, 171 pilots ejected from the Starfighters, 8 of them twice. Contrary to the legends, the German Starfighters, including also the initial horrible period, consumed the pilots in average less than the MiG-21 family in Hungary. Yet, no one ever called the MiG-21's Widowmaker, not even in retrospect. Of course, such information in the Eastern Bloc was not public. The nickname for the German Starfighters and the jokes about the plane came likely due to the second year of service and the year of 1965. Following this period, the loss was on par or was even better compared to the contemporary Mach 2 capable fighters. Of course, this did not receive as much publicity because it was not a sensation for the press that normal operation was happening. However, in the beginning, the accident or disaster with the new fighter was so common that even jokes were made about it. The statistics of the other Starfighter operators mostly was not better than what the Luftwaffe achieved, see the summary table. Assuming that the number of hours flown per plane was roughly the same in Western countries, the rate of the fleet loss should increase proportionally with the length of service. The values, on the other hand, are telling a bit different story. During the 30 years of service in Italy, the fleet loss rate was higher compared to the Luftwaffe, while the loss per hours flown was smaller, which means Italian starfighters flew significantly less. The Italian planes flew about 130 hours per year in average, which means less for a single pilot because air forces have more pilots than planes. According to an interview with a German F-104 pilot, German pilots flew about 160 hours a year in the 70s and 80s. The French took apart in the negative publicity around the Starfighter because they had benefits because of the export of their fighter jets. Meanwhile, it was kept in shadow that the accident statistics of the French Mirage 3 fighters was quite the same or even worse. From the 116 acquired Mirage 3 fighter planes of the Royal Australian Air Force, 42 were lost, representing a 36% fleet loss rate roughly during of 25 years of service. In Belgium, 43 of the 106 aircraft acquired Mirage 5, a subvariant of the Mirage 3, were lost. This means a 40% loss over a period of around 30 years. We can see it was not much difference between the types of the era, considering the fleet percentage loss. The Starfighter cannot be considered tragically bad, it was not great, not terrible. What was the cause of this bad reputation? Most importantly, the Starfighter was a huge leap forward compared to the F-86 Sabre Supersonic Fighter. Serious mistakes were made in the training of both of pilots and maintenance crew. Another major issue was that for a while, the political leadership did not provide the necessary resources to operate the new fighters. 
It was also a significant factor that the Luftwaffe is used the F-104G in a low-level strike and reconnaissance role, while the original base model was not designed for that. Thanks to the intervention of General Johanna Steinhoff, he was a veteran of World War II and the provision of the necessary resources, the accident statistics of the Starfighter dramatically improved in the following years. With the exception of the first four years of the service, the German Starfighter became an average plane in terms of accident rate. However, the public do not know much about it because the press has completely destroyed the reputation of the Starfighter. Even 50 years after that problematic period, the nickname Videomaker still lives in the mind of public, it's fairly easy to find an article or video what refers on the F-104 family as a terrible airplane. If we have already immersed in the safety of the Starfighter, it is worth looking at the evolution of the flight safety from the 50s to present days. America has always been considered a leader and pioneer in the use of the Air Force. What a luck that the flight safety data of older American fighter jets and the planes in service today are also available. Link is in the video description. Data about the P-18 shooting star, later called F-18, fighter is available only between from 1915 and 53. The plane made its first flight in 1944, but it is an essentially post-World War II fighter. The P-80 had 50 airframe loss per 100,000 flight hours in 1950, but this improved over time. In the early 50s, because of the insane pace of development, fighters were quickly replaced with a newer type. In 1953, the P-80 had only 33 aircraft losses per 100,000 flight hours. This value is terribly high considering today's standards, but it is clearly visible that the accident rate decreased with 33% following 4 years of service. But the P-80 retired in 1953, so the trend could not continue. The F-86 Sabre had a similarly high specific loss rate at the beginning. It started in 1915 with 44% loss per 100,000 flight hours. The loss rate dropped to 10 after 13 years of service. The Sabre also quickly became obsolete, so only a small number of planes remained in service. This causes statistical fluctuations. The loss rate was higher in some years in the 60s than in the late 50s period. But considering the entire life cycle of the fleet, this fighter also brought an improvement over the previous generation in safety. The next American fighter is the first supersonic, heavily swapping design, the F-100 Super Sabre. We can see terrible loss rate at the beginning of its career. Its initial loss rate in 1955 was 55 planes per 100,000 flight hours. It was simply awful. The deployment of the Super Sabre happened with insane pace. The Super Sabre was particularly dangerous during landing, many pilots killed in this phase of flight. This was the phenomenon later called Sabre Dance. Countless pilots at low speed on the edge of losing control tried to land or go around. What could lead to disaster? Link is in the description about the Sabre Dance. Gary Barnhill, a pilot who served also on the F-100, recalled in a lecture the safety of the plane. Following his first two months of service, six of his 13 companions who have done the training with him were already dead. Why? As he said, too many planes, too few experience. Many of the units flew with a very dangerous, asymmetric weapon configuration while they practiced nuclear strikes. Many air forces in the world experienced the same. Being a pilot on a high-end fighter at the time was not a life insurance. When the F-100 was only a second-line reserve plane in mid-60s, the loss rate decreased to about 10 losses per 100,000 flight hours and sometimes was even below that. This shows even a very dangerous plane can be operated with better safety, but it needed time and the toll in lives were very high to achieve that. Interestingly, the contemporary F-101 Voodoo proved to be a much safer fighter plane. At the beginning of its career, the loss rate started around 20, but only after 5 years it remained essentially in the range of less than 10. That was above average in that time. 
About the F4 Phantom, the source contains data only from 1971 onwards, following roughly after 10 years of service. In a sense, the 5-6 plane loss per 100,000 flight hours was achieved to the early 70s. The average for the whole service from 1971 is 4.4 losses per 100,000 flight hours. This is roughly only one tenth specific loss compared to the short-lived P-18. This will be a good benchmark for later planes. For the F-15 and F-16 fighters operated by the US Air Force, the specific loss remained below 5-6 aircraft per 100,000 flight hours following the first 5 years of their service. When the loss exceeded this level, that could be considered as anomaly and statistical fluctuation. Even in the case of the single-engine F-16, the specific loss fell to the 3-4 planes per 100,000 flight hours after the first 10 years and it was 2-3 after the 20th years of service. After the 25th year, loss rate above 2 can be called an anomaly. In 2005 and 2040, not a single US F-16 was lost, despite the fact that the fleet spent 324,000 and 195,000 hours in the air. The average loss for the entire service life is 2.97 planes per 100,000 flight hours. The average of the last 5 and 10 years is 1.37 and 1.52 airframes per 100,000 hours respectively. This is a good indication how improved the safety in the second half in the life cycle of the F-16 fleet. For the twin-engine F-15 fleet, the average lifetime loss is 1.84 planes per 100,000 flight hours. For the last 5 and 10 years respectively, 0.36 and 0.91 airframes per 100,000 flight hours. From the 6th year of the Eagle service, the loss of more than 3 planes per 100,000 flight hours was considered an anomaly despite the problems of the F-100 engine. This has impact also on the F-16s, which until the Block 30-32 variants used the same F-100 engine. By 2020, the Air Force lost 340 F-16s, while 87 pilots did not survive the loss of their aircraft. This is 25% pilot loss rate. In case of F-15, these two values are 127 lost planes and 45 killed pilots, which means 35% loss rate. For the latter, it has to be noted that the F-15E flew in significant numbers from the mid-90s. It has two crew, which may distort the statistics a bit. The improvement in ejection seats and training is clearly noticeable, more pilots survive the ejections. The two latest US fighter jets were able to outperform even these improved safety figures. By the end of 2020, the F-22 fleet had spent 382,000 hours in the air and so far only 5 planes were lost. The 15-year average of the specific loss since entered the plane service is 1.31 per 100,000 flight hours. For the last 5 and 10 years of service, the loss rate is only 0.63 and 1.04. The trend is improving as usual, but the initial loss rate of the Raptor was smaller than any previous fighters. In the first 162,000 flight hours, 4 Raptors were lost, then only one in the remaining 220,000 flight hours. The F-35A variant went even beyond that. By the end of 2019, the US fleet flew 96,000 hours and not a single plane was lost. On the diagram, the trend of improvement in loss rates is well visible only because of the statistical fluctuation are some years off from the trend line. The reliability of the planes changed a lot in the US Air Force in the last 60 years. This was important not only because of the protection of the pilots, but also because of the ever-increasing cost of fighters. Even with the specific loss rate of the F-4 Phantom from the mid-60s would be intolerable considering the financial burden. Due to the predictable high losses, significantly more planes would be needed to manufacture to maintain a capability by a fleet of any fighter jet. If you liked the video, share, subscribe and ring the bell and follow the channel. You can support the channel via Patreon for exchange early access for videos, voting on planet topics and extra contact is accessible as well as regular updates about the project.